three uh, means of uh, conditioning. And the last piece here is the development of mid-level uh, clinical uh, uh, theory. And uh, that's that hexagon model that um, I just uh, walked you through, although I feel rather ineptly. And I apologize for that. Next, test the treatment package. And you know, usually the way of doing this is create a treatment for a particular disorder, and then you test, you go through that whole treatment uh, development strategy with that particular disorder, and then you apply it elsewhere. <coughs> this is what we've done, is we have done this simultaneously, tested the treatment package um, across many different populations, different kinds of difficulties, Many different, in many different settings, so primary care, healthcare settings, um, in a disability study Joanne Dahl and I did in people's homes, and where we went and talked to them, people who had chronic pain, who were in, um, at risk for being on long-term disability, using different treatment pro uh, formats. So there are studies out there right now with individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy, workshop types of interventions that have rooms full of people as big as this. Um, I just got one that I'll show you in a minute that is an internet-based um, um, model of acceptance and commitment therapy that's delivered in a suggested eight visits uh, to an internet website. So all of these have been going on so uh, simultaneously. In addition, we've been testing the components. So some of these component processes in very basic uh, laboratory uh, kinds of studies. Uh, uh, next, and this one's going on simultaneously, is the building of tests and measures of theoretical change processes. So it's not enough for me to say more acceptance uh, produces better outcomes. The reason ACT works is because ACT changes acceptance and acceptance changes outcomes. It's not good enough for me to say that. Uh, what I need to do is I need to be able to measure acceptance and demonstrate the treatment changes acceptance and the changes in acceptance predict treatment outcome. Last one here, assess the mechanisms and validate the model in the laboratory and in the clinic. You gotta have the measures in order to validate the model and I agree with Paul entirely on that issue. It isn't good enough to just show that the treatment works. We need to show how it works. Quick, I know we're over. I'm going to just show you a couple of quick pieces here. What's going on in this body of work? I said the test of these things is, does it generate a large body of evidence? And the answer to that, I think, is a resounding yes. We have not had a treatment protocol uh, uh, out there, but you know, since 1999 that we had a treatment protocol published. This is a meta-analysis of ACT components. So you take these different therapy components, like making contact with the present moment, like uh, diffusion kinds of exercises. Now, some of these interventions in the laboratory are as short as like a minute, two minutes. So they're little, tiny interventions very often. Um, there are 66 studies entered into the graph I'm going to show you with over 1,100 participants. Now, I could show you the one that's got like all of the studies, but uh, it would make your head pop to look at the picture. Uh, as it says at the bottom here, uh, many of these focus all the way down to just like one metaphor or one little experiential exercise. Now, in order to read this, this is uh, Hedges G, which is a measure of like how big of a difference did these things make? Bear in mind that some of these studies are at the level of like a single metaphor, a single brief exercise. And the Hedges G, we're looking at things like persistence and willingness. So if you do this intervention and you put someone in a cognitive task or something like dipping their arm in freezing cold water, you know, will they uh, persist longer in doing difficult things? And what we find here is the um, average weight <coughs> effect size in the 0.69 range. Now that's a, you know, between a moderate and large effect size on persistence and willingness. 
Why is this important? Well, because lots and lots of the trouble that people get into is that they don't persist in the things that they need to do that are hard and painful. How about subjective distress? Smaller effect sizes there. Uh, 0.13, the weighted is 0.37, so it's a relatively small effect size on distress. So it's not changing distress tremendously. Some, uh, and if it's to this side of the red line, that means uh, that it is uh, in the direction of less distress. And the last one is subjective distress while recovering from the task. So one is, you go into this difficult task, and then we ask the question, how rapidly does the person recover? And again, the impact of these interventions has been remarkably consistent. Now, scientists are rarely interested in individual studies. Individual studies, really, the only thing they tell you is what you need to do next, right? Individuals, because anything can happen in one study, but things uh, that happen persistently across studies, those are the ones that uh, really begin to get uh, scientists' attention. Here we've seen remarkable consistency. Now, another important area is mediation. So how do people change when they change in the therapy? The mediational model, I'm going to show you this kind of really quickly because it is painful to look at. Does the treatment change the outcome? That's what we want to know. But not just does it change the outcome, as Paul said, but does it change the outcome by the mediator that we said? So for example, ACT should work by changing uh, psychological flexibility. And so the treatment should change psychological flexibility, and psychological flexibility should change the treatment outcome. In uh, Paul's theory, the intervention should change the negative cognition, and changes in the negative cognition ought to change the outcome variable. Those things should be related in that way. Ideally, you show a temporal uh, effect where the cause goes away before the effect. Always bad for causation if the causes change after the effect. And what we want to know here is we take out all the variability in this path that we can account for by the mediator that the treatment uh, effectiveness is washed out. So if this accounted for 100% of this, this would be a non-significant uh, change. It's the basic uh, model. <coughs> now here's a study, 2007. It's just one study. Um, and so it just begs for the next study. And, um, uh, you know, and we have somebody in the room who's just the right person to do these studies. Jared et al. went to look at cognitive therapy and asked this question. When cognitive therapy works, does it work by changing negative cognition? So they measured depression at multiple time points. And they measured negative thoughts at multiple time points, same time points, so they can get the temporal order. So does cognitive therapy change depression? Well, yes, it does, obviously. I mean, that was like a no-brainer. We know that cognitive therapy is an effective treatment for depression. In fact, both long-term, more effective uh, than uh, psychopharmacology, for example. Over the short term, not too much different. Over the long term, clearly more effective. So does cognitive therapy change depression? Yes, of course it does. Does cognitive therapy change negative thoughts? Turns out that on average, it does change negative thoughts. But the last question, and this is the important one for mediation, is um, do those changes in negative thoughts translate to changes in depression? And what they found was no. Here's what they found instead. They found that the changes in negative cognition were substantial, Enduring, but not predictive of depressive outcome. Regression analyses, in fact, showed, so there was a correlation between negative cognition and depressive outcome, but what the regression analyses showed, that reductions in depressive symptoms accounted for change in cognitive content, not the other way around. That reductions in depression caused lessening of negative cognition not lessening of negative cognition causing changes in depression. Now these are not the only data out here that look like this. And uh, even the most uh, charitable view would say that that core cognitive hypothesis is in question. 
I'm not saying that it's false, but I'm saying there are experimental evidence that call it to question. Now, what do uh, Jared and all think? They think, well, maybe we just didn't do a good job measuring it. Maybe our measures aren't sensitive to it. Could that be true? Sure, it could be true. But you've got to show that it's true. You can't just suggest that it's true. The fear hypothesis, I mentioned that one. You know, so does behavior therapy change anxiety? And of course, yes, exposure therapies are effective in uh, treating anxiety disorders, get better outcomes. Krask asks this question, though, based on uh, a very old idea and a very prominent idea that exposure therapies work by fear reduction. They work through fear reduction. And so if you ask that question, does behavior therapy change fear? And again, the answer is yes, on average. Not always, but on average, it changes fear levels. Now the critical question, and this isn't one study, this is a whole bunch of studies that Michelle looked at. She looked at ending fear levels and changes in fear levels to ask this question, do changes in fear levels predict treatment outcomes? Right? And what she found was, no, they do not. In fact, she says, she concludes in this article, Evidence indicates that neither the degree by which fear reduces nor any fear level predict therapeutic outcome. So what does this mean for people coming in? Well, it means if you come in and do exposure-based therapy, maybe your fear will go down and maybe you won't. Maybe it won't. But here's the good news. You get to be free in your life. You get to move in your life. You get to go to the places that you want to go on the days when there's fear there and on the days when there isn't. Now, what did Michelle find predicted therapeutic outcomes, if not fear reduction, breadth of exposure experiences. So the more and varied kinds of exposure experiences that the person engaged in, the better the therapeutic outcomes. Now there are direct clinical implications, I think, of uh, this kind of work. Let me just show you uh, one example of uh, a smoking cessation. This one just came across my desk. It just published. Um, I'll let you have it if you uh, contact me. 222 uh, individuals in this pilot study for a web-based uh, uh, act treatment for smoking compared to a National Cancer Institute web-based program uh, to stop smoking. They were advised to get on eight times over uh, uh, the period of treatment and um, at three-month follow-up, the quit rates in the act condition were 23% compared to 10% uh, uh, in the National Cancer Institute uh, trial. This is currently being uh, replicated in a study that will treat um, over uh, 2,200 uh, smokers. Uh, this kind of intervention, I think, is extraordinarily important, not just not having to do just with that, but having to do with the accessibility and affordability of uh, psychological treatment. And it suggests that this treatment can be delivered in an incredibly simple and uh, uh, a cost-effective way. And the punchline of this story is something like this, that Jonathan Bricker measured acceptance of urges, acceptance of emotions, acceptance of negative cognitions, acceptance of smoking cues. What he found was that the total score for acceptance counted for 80% of the effect in quit rates. 80% of the effect. So does ACT change quit rates? Yes, more than double them in this study. <coughs> Did ACT change acceptance level? Yes, it changed acceptance level. Did acceptance levels predict quit rates? Yes. We are on the road to validating uh, this model for now. Just a quick look at the mediational studies, and there are a bunch of mediational studies that are out there, and a bunch more that are in the pipeline. How to read this? What this is, is a graph showing the proportion of the effect, the treatment outcome, that is mediated by, theoretically, uh, uh, by the theoretical processes within the model. So does acceptance, does psychological flexibility, uh, does diffusion predict good treatment outcomes? And what you see here is an extraordinary level of consistency in the data. Um, this red line right here, using this particular 
uh, effect size measure is a large effect size. And what you see here is uh, some just extraordinarily uh, large amounts of variance in outcome that are accounted for by uh, the properties suggested in the model. I'm going to skip this and sometimes I hear this kind of complaint like, is ACT just a fad? And I would say, we'll see. We'll see. In 2000, when the first treatment protocol came out, we had uh, two randomized clinical trials. In 2009, when Powers et al. was published, we had 29 published randomized clinical trials. There's only about 19 of them in Powers' study, and it's because he didn't start the study until you know, about 2007, and it takes a long time to get things published. But by the time it was out, there were 29, and if you look, uh, as of one year ago, I need to get in there and update these slides, we went from 29 to 62 randomized clinical trials uh, uh, just in that short span of three years. If you want to see what that is looking like right now, that's the list of randomized clinical trials on app that were either published in print or in press in 2012. So you see what's going on with this line? 18 in the last year. So is it a fad? We'll see. The other thing I would encourage you to look at here is the incredibly broad array of uh, difficulties uh, that are being examined. So sometimes people ask me, what is ACT for? What is the condition ACT is for? And so I'm going to offer a diagnostic tool for this condition. Place your fingers in the hollow of your wrist right here, and if you feel a vague pulsing sensation, you have it. You know, the condition that ACT, that we're trying, and I'm not saying we've done this, I'm saying this is our aspiration. The condition we're aiming for is the human condition, which includes the people we call clients and includes the people we call therapists. A confession, and then I'll end. I am not interested in a psychology of symptom remission. I am not interested in a psychology of psychopathology. I am interested in a robust science of human liberation, and I will settle for nothing less. <laughs> than my heroes. Thank you. Sorry I ran so long. I'll take questions from almost anyone. <laughs> you used all yours up. Were those questions? Questions? Oh, it's hot in here. Let's have fun.